Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 112. Thanks so much for joining me. I'm glad you could make it, even though the we had a last-minute time switch. Um, before we begin, I should say that uh, Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this because we love poetry, and I know you do too. So please uh, do click the like button and share. Make sure you're subscribed, all the good stuff like that. And um, that way, poetry can spread around the internet, and that's what we're trying to do here. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. A little fewer. We'll wait a little bit for as, as people trickle in. Um Let's see, make sure everything's running properly. There's there's Dick. Hey, good morning, Richard Westheimer. Let's see. Okay. Okay, we're officially running for good. Now, um, today's guest is going to be Marissa Davis. She'll be joining us in about 15 minutes. But before we do that, I'm going to talk to today's poet, Alejandro Escudé. Let's call him up. He's the uh, the Poet Respond poet today. Call up Alex. Hey, Alex, how are you doing today? Hi, Tim, how are you? I'm I'm doing great. It's great to talk to you again. Yes, yeah, sorry about the Skype thing. I tried to get back on it, and it wouldn't let me. It, it was one of those infinite loop things. <laughs> no, no, no problem yeah. at all. I mean, the phone works yeah. just as well. So, um, Okay. So, so, so let's start off. I want to talk more about Poetry Respond a little bit, because you're the new record holder for, well, I don't know if even, you might have already been. You might have just beat your record. But this is the eleventh oh, wow. time you've appeared in Poet Respond, <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about you. that. Uh, but first, um, let's talk about your poem that you wrote this week, "Moon's End." Do you want to explain a little bit about yes. what that is about? Yes. Uh, well, I saw this great. Uh, I, I'm really liking the Atlantic lately. Uh, they have great articles, um, and they talked about how the moon is sort of retreating, or you know, kind of getting further and further away. And I just thought it was fascinating um, that it was um, kind of just neat. Uh, I, I think it just goes with, you know, what's sort of the zeitgeist right now. Um, it, it's kind of, at first I was kind of like, oh, my God, just another example of bad news, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, that's all we need. You know, the mood is also going away from us. Um, but... Um, just the, the details were interesting. You know, the fact that the Apollo uh, program put lasers up there that uh, measures the distance, you know, so that we could actually know this now. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of great details. So that's an article I really recommend. Yeah, yeah, I recommend this article, too. It, it's almost written uh, yeah. like poetry. I mean, it's a beautifully written article from the Atlantic yes, that was yes. um, just uh, September 30th, so four days ago, if anybody wants to go find it. The title is, uh, The Moon is Leaving Us and We Can't Stop It. Mm -hmm. And, um, and yes. of course, the thing is just that the, the gravity is a little bit too... I, I don't even know. Did, did it say why? I can't remember. Is there, is there a reason why the moon is being pulled? I mean, the gravity... like it's, it's Somehow it's like in a, a very slow escape orbit, but does it say why? Yeah, no, I... I, I you know what? I have to reread it. It probably does. Um you know, if it doesn't, then it didn't do too much journalistic <laughs> integrity. So it should, it should do. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I have to look, uh, but that would be interesting. Yeah. I gravitated toward, uh, just other facts, um, you know, about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It does yeah. feel like a, a sort of a, and, and well, you said it like a, like a metaphor for the current zeitgeist somehow, but on, in a way that I can't yes. quite put my finger on, like it feels like it does relate to sort of everything that's going on right now. But I'm not quite yeah. sure exactly how, which is why the poem really works, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that's what I, I think when I, when I write a poem that works, uh, there's a sort of thing, I was thinking about what you asked about how I, I do it, and there's just, it feels like serendipity, uh, like uh, a story comes together with where you are mm -hmm. in your life, and then where the, the, the society is. Uh, and there's this sort of blending uh, that happens. And um, yeah, so it, it feels like luck, you know, where you find the story and then you sit down and you and you write the poem. Um, it almost feels like you're not well, like like people say, it feels like you're channeling it rather mm -hmm. than uh, rather than writing it. Um, the ones that I write are, are often important, too, because, you know, I'm, I'm practicing uh, for, for those moments uh, yeah, where yeah. it's going to be a, 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 a very important 
you know, a kind of uh, just luck that you're sitting there and, and um, able to capture uh, what you're, the moment, Mm -hmm. you know? So it's almost like a, like a, a situation where you're, where you're an antenna and you're always looking out for these things. Um, and then uh, it just comes together, but also, you know, your skill level because you've been practicing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That, that's something so, I want to talk about. Do yeah. you, do you know how many times you've submitted a poet respond? And do you mind if I say, <laughs> uh, no, no, you can, if you have so, that, that's, that's I, I was curious. So I looked up. <laughs> so you submit almost every week. Like it's like a part of your, you know, weekly routine in over seven yes. years, that becomes 473 yeah. times. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is really impressive. And, you know, and because you're a good poet, like every poem, every week I know that there's going to be something worth publishing no matter what, because like, we're probably going to get one of your poems. <laughs> but, oh, thanks, um, man. And so, yeah. so you kind of keep this whole poet respond propped up in a way. You're like my, uh, you know, no matter what, I know I got you. Um, <laughs> so, but but what, can you, you talk a little bit, though, about what... What it's been like to write a news article? I mean, writing a, writing a poem about a news article almost every week for seven and a half years, because um, yeah. you you were one of the first. I think you were like the fourth person we published, and now we've published I think twelve of your poems um, that you've submitted wow. through Poets yeah. Respond. Um, but yeah, how right? it must have like changed? It must must like alter the way that you think about your week if you if you know you're gonna at some point write a, a poem about the news, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, to me, I think that, you know, I got a job as a journalist uh, when I was in my 20s. Uh, mm-hmm. I was a, a, a I was in a, a news, um, uh, worked for a newspaper for Brentwood, um, and which is, uh, you know, kind of a high end community in L.A. And so I was there during, you know, the Monica Lewinsky thing and all of that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually had to, you know, um, try to get an interview with her when she got back to Brentwood. It was funny. Uh, but I have lots of stories. And so I think the other career that almost happened for me was being a journalist. Um, I interviewed with the LA Times. Um, I didn't get that job. And then I just sort of just became a teacher. And mm-hmm. I like being a teacher, but I think it's sort of a, always in the back of my mind, I'm always uh, sort of a jur- I have a journalist's uh, point, you know, uh, kind of feel for things. So I'm always looking, I, I think that I've always been looking for stories um, to write about. And rather, and what's nice is that now I, 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 that's not my job, so I don't have to find all the facts. Um, I don't have to look for the, I don't have to write the article, mm-hmm. which uh, articles, you know, I ended up getting in, <laughs> it's funny, a, a poet being a journalist is not the greatest thing, because <laughs> I would, I would stretch the truth a little. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. I would, I would, uh, my, my articles were very, very creative, let's just say, you know. Yeah, yeah, some, um, some poet journalists have gotten in trouble for that <laughs> over the years. I, yeah. I would, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's true. Because so, I think yeah, we think so about truth in a different way, you know, as poets. We yeah. think of like, like, like we're being honest even if we're stretching the facts because we're look, we're yeah. finding the real truth is what what poetry yeah. does. And so, and sometimes there, yeah. I always think of like like facts are um like like details are sort of mm-hmm. not they're less true than the truth because they're they're um fixed yeah. in time and space like they they only they can say different things based on their context you know and the truth is sort of the right. the deep focus view or, or the other i guess right. the opposite of deep focus but but where you see the whole thing where everything is clear and and sometimes the yes. facts don't match up with the real truth beneath the facts or something and i think that's a problem that po- yeah. poet and journalists would have all the time yeah, but you know what? Honestly, I think all journalists, uh, because if you, you know, if you look at journalism in general, there's always a little bit of a stretching. There's always uh, they want to over dramatize, uh, you know, and that's poetry, too. Like uh, if you're looking at, you know, everybody's mad at, you know, something like CNN or MSNBC for being uh, too opinionated or, or dramatic or whatever. And it's true that, that, that that's not good. That's yellow journalism. But um but I think all journalism stretches and and makes things uh, more dramatic than they are. Um, if you look at any article in the newspaper or you know L.A. Times or whatever, there's it, it, it's it's got an element. I'd say at least two three percent of exaggeration mm-hmm. just in the just in the tone. Yeah, yeah. So everybody you know everybody exaggerates. Well, uh, even it's just more, that poets you know. Yeah, there's that. Yeah. Um, are you familiar with a gel man amnesia? concept i think it was michael Cri- yeah it was michael Crichton that came up with it he named it after his friend uh-huh. the physicist murray gell are you familiar with that uh-huh uh, no that, no 
That that's um. So he used to make fun of uh, his friend Murray because um, he'd read yeah. an article that talked about like physics in any way because Murray Gellman was a physicist, and um, uh-huh. he'd just be furious because it would get all the details wrong and everything would be wrong. And then, uh, but then Murray would turn the page and read an article about uh-huh. like the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or something, and assume that the journalist, <laughs> yeah. you know, the article is completely right. And um, yeah. and, and we kind of get like that. Like anytime you know what the details about the story, you kind you see what's yeah. wrong with the story, r- regardless. Yeah. Th- which means every single story is wrong. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, it, it it's all coming from a different point of view. You know, it's like Homer's Odyssey. You mm-hmm. know. Um, it all goes back to that kind of like, you know, um, uh, storytelling is storytelling, no matter what. Um, there's yeah. never going to be a situation where, you know, I think they say that, you know, human memory fades almost immediately, too. So, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we're rewriting, you know, over the top and yeah. over the top every time, like a like a v- yeah. VHS tape that gets all scratchy. Yeah, With, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and I mean, I, I've always been exaggerated in that, though. You know, I, I I've always had a, a little bit more than the average. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah. so I want to ask one more thing, and then we'll read your poem. But, but how do you how do yeah. you decide how do you know when a story is one of those stories that, that a poem is going to be in there? Like, is there something you're yeah. looking for in a story? How does that how do, and and when do you know that you have it? Is it only in the process of writing it, or is it? Um, mm-hmm. Do you know as soon as you see the story? Oh, there's a poem there, and it's going to work. You know, I I thought about that because I teach creative writing too, and 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 I was thinking, what could I, you know, offer for that? And I think it's just. Um, there's something I, I, I was looking at some of the steps I take when I do it. And I think uh, a big thing is it, it stirs your passion, you know? So like you're reading a story and somehow it makes you upset or it makes you uh, very happy that you saw that. Um, so it, it just, it just hits you hmm. in some way. And I think that maybe I think people uh, write stories that make them feel good um, uh, write poems about stories that makes them feel good. But, um, I tend to write stories that make me upset and mm-hmm. then I write about it and I don't take the, uh, I think it's very important not to take the crudeness out, uh, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So for example, like in this poem, I may have stopped myself because who wants to talk shit about the moon? You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you want to be nice, you know, you, you like the moon, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but I wanted, but I went, I went with, being pissed off at the moon, you know, <laughs> like, I'm like, you want to go away, go away. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> it's kind of like COVID. You, 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 you know, COVID's coming fine. Come, let's go, let's get it over with, you know? And, yeah. and, uh, the, I, I went with that. And I think that that's something maybe some people are not letting themselves do. Hmm. Um, um, maybe not letting themselves be crude. And then, you know, you have to sort of be careful with that too, because sometimes it's too crude or it's too, you know, you're realizing that you're too angry or, you know, um, so you use, that's where the editing comes, you know, or just ignore it, you know? Mm-hmm. Well, but, well uh, yeah. 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 Well, let's hear this poem, uh, Moon's End by Alejandro okay. Eskide. Go ahead whenever you're ready up. I'll put it up on the screen for people watching. Okay. Thank you. Moon's End. Maybe the moon should go. I'll stay up late to see it finally, what? Break off like a lemon yanked from a branch? Detached like a plug from a plug? Maybe it'll just fade away, pretending that it was never dependent on anyone else's pull. Don't look at me like that. I'm no fool. I know that wishing it away is the same as wishing for my own end, the tides rolling me out toward the dark, a castaway from existence. I don't understand the mathematics of its retreat, how the lasers read its distance, catch it on the lies the moon tells our eyes, its trick of romance. No dance, only the threat of loneliness. What they say is true, the historians. Imagine all it has witnessed over the eons, Caesar's collapse, the powdered eruption of towers, pinprick messiah hung revolutions and finally the glint that floated down to its flank settling spider-like on a plane when it goes it goes ever outward toward a space that cannot resolve itself the end of a love affair a marriage between the living and the dead 
Alejandro Escudé, thanks so much for joining us and sharing that poem, Moon's End. Thank, thanks, uh, Taylor. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Have a good day. Okay, bye. Bye. That was Alejandro Escudé with uh, today's Poets Respond poem, Moon's End. And um, he gets the, the, the trophy for, for most Poets Respond right now. I think uh, Sony Greenfield has nine. I think she might be in second. Abby E. Murray was up there, too. I should recount again. Uh, but I think those are the, the top three Poets Responders. Um, so now we're going to take a quick break and uh, we're going to call up um, our main guest, Marissa Davis. So hang on and I'll be back in just a moment. And we're back. Thanks so much for your patience. As I mentioned, today's guest is Marissa Davis. Uh, her, in her chapbook, My Name and Other Languages, I Am Learning How to Speak. Marissa Davis is a poet and translator from Paducah, Kentucky, now residing in Brooklyn, New York, although she's in Paris, France right now. Um, her poetry has appeared or will soon appear in Sundog Lit, Poem a Day, Glass, a whole bunch of other things. Her translations are published all over the place, too, in Massachusetts Review, New England Review, Mid-American Review, etc. Um, her chapbook, which we're going to be talking about now, My Name and Other Languages, I Am Learning How to Speak, uh, was selected by Denez Smith for the Cave Canem's 2019 Toy Derricotte and Cornelius Eady Prize. Um, Davis holds an MFA from New York University. And uh, here she is, Marissa Davis. Hey, Marissa, how you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm great. It's great to see you. And and so you're in Paris, France. Um, I am. <laughs> and uh, and you've been a longer stay than you intended. Um, yeah. <laughs> so so, so um, first, just I mean, because we changed the show time, so it made me wonder, like, what are you? Uh, what brought you there to Paris? Um, really, just the chance to be here. I used to live here, um, and I I taught English for a couple of years in a mm-hmm. bilingual school. Well, first as an assistant, and then in a bilingual school full time afterwards. Um, and then I, I moved to New York for, for grad school, mm-hmm. I guess, two years ago and hadn't really had the chance to come back. And I still have a, quite a lot of friends here. Mm-hmm. Um, I started a job that allowed me to work, allows me currently to work remotely. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah. And so I can kind of be more or less anywhere, um, you know, time zones allowing. And so I'm working like 3 p.m. until 11 p.m. midnight right now. But mm-hmm. it allows me the chance to be here. So it's quite fun. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, do you want to start out with a poem? For sure. Okay. Um, so I'm going to read kind of a mix of old and new work today. Um, and the one I'm going to start with is a, a rather new one. Um, and the title is Lot's Wife. It was a cold spring, like an epiphany bludgeoned. Fred bare a land without violet irises to suture the wine of dust. Oh, this country, this knacker slaughterhouse. Our fates were a plowed migration route, a tangle of grapevine. The seraph's catalyst. Only my husband would give the newcomers what was deserved. A cooked meal, a place to pose weary heads. The rest would aim to own them, distilling each body to a convenient use. Youth, this country's tungsten covenant. What the generation's fungal fruit, breaking flesh down to blooded colony. We, too, were called strangers here, had learned this. What is left to say, then, when a distant maker rears to gash the fields with sulfur, and the red sun rolls to close its wings, and horizon mutates into a crust of flies, the sky a woozy lantern, an inferno rain, a reckoning. Wait. 
Let me begin again. I turned. I couldn't stop me. One could say because I had no other origin, my mother no other tongue. Or I remembered how the river wrapped my thighs like fresh silk, how my throat tensed to sob when owl song hauled dusk back to the woods black branches. Or I thought of my children, of my childhood, of how I had nowhere else to go on this whole heartbroken earth. And perhaps that meant there was some hard stone sharding in me too. I was something other, closer than a brute beast whelp. I was an avatar of my own enemy. Its skin was mine and I was no python who could whip my shape to shed it. Let me begin again. I was made here an ancient woman, a body without a country, a body without a body. The love in me, a charred dahlia, a salted field, my name kept hidden from my face. I turned, a peculiar triumph, as ruin succumbed to the ruin it birthed, and our twin threads whirled into one fray set to snap. I was a rage first, then I was clean rapture, and the moon was falling over Sodom like an axe. A powerful poem uh, that was Lot's Wife, um, a new one from Marissa Davis. Um, Marissa, there's a weird, the uh, sound is cutting out occasionally. For, I think ah. it, um, it, it seemed like almost it was when you clicked on to move your the screen down on your laptop, maybe. Um, That's probably it. It would just, uh, yeah, it would just like mute for just a second. And so, or, or like muffle for just a second, weirdly. Um, so I don't know, is, is there something that might be causing that? Or uh, maybe we could pull off the head headphones too. What I can do is I can pull it up on my phone rather and maybe read that way. Yeah, Perhaps yeah, maybe try that. Because I think it's not happening when we just talk. So I think I think it has something to do with like the clicking on the computer. Um, but, so but if strange. I hear it again, then we'll try to do it without the headphones because we're on a different computer than we were before. But um, okay. anyway, um, can you explain a little bit about like your journey into poetry? I'm always really interested in that. Like, how did you become a poet and like why and like, like what drew you to it? And do you remember like the first poem you fell in love with or something? Like, is there a reason that you became a poet? Oh, goodness. I mean, I have loved writing since I was quite young. I used to write fiction when I was when I was a kid until about middle school, early high school. Um and, but I, I think I, I, in some ways, came to poetry through music. Um, I'm not a musician, but mm -hmm. when I was younger, um, my cousins and I had a kind of a, a faux rock band that, that we would play whenever we got together for the holidays. Um, and I was the songwriter, so my job was to write the lyrics. And I think it really was something that I, I fell in love with, the, just the kind of the musical sensations of words, how rhythms work, how, how things can kind of play off of one another. Um, and kind of how that alters as well the meaning of a piece. Mm -hmm. um, and But it was still something that I kind of kept to the back of me um, until when I was in high school. I So Kentucky has this program. So I'm from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. um, Kentucky has a, a program for high schoolers, um, high school artists called the Governor's School for the Arts. And I was accepted into that based on writing fiction. But all of my teachers that particular year happened to be poets. And so we worked a lot on poetry. And it was one of my, my first real exposures to a lot of contemporary poetry as well. In high school, middle school, you tend to focus a lot more on you know Shakespeare and, and quite rather old stuff. Um, and I think that was when I, I really fell in love with, with the art. Um, and I think the first work that kind of captured me was Sylvia Plath's Lady Lazarus. Mm -hmm. um, I think, A, again, Sylvia Plath has such an incredible kind of rhythm and musicality to our work, but also the way in which that particular piece conjures this, this, it creates this tripartite self. There's the self as victim, the self as, as perpetrator, the self as witness, and the way in which it, it feels like only poetry is capable of that kind of, that multi-layered, multi-functioning, um, just kind of self as, as cosmology, self as like, as universe, um, and the way in which poetry itself kind of functions in a similar sense and the way that it kind of, you know, music is a part of poetry. Also, the visual aspect is a part of poetry. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, the semantic, you know, literal word by word, what does it mean aspect is a part of poetry. 
And I think it's just this wonderful sense of a marriage between a lot of different things that that appeals to me. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that you say that because what really stands out in your work, and, and the, we published two of your poems. There was a Poet Respond poem um, that's in the chat book and then in Catabasis in the um, Appalachian Poets issue. And what really stands out is the way that you layer, um, like you sort of, it's interesting. There's so many layers to the, the writing and it, the way you play with, you know, experiment with the, the look on the page and punctuation and let things move around and leap freely almost between like, I must imagine like looking at like transparency sheets, like laid on top of each other in your poems. And, um, and then, it, but it's all tied through the music too. So it's interesting to hear you describe that. Um, uh, what's your what's your process like for creating poems like that because you you seem it's so freely um there's just like these leaps all over the place and, and it, it, the narrative thread like holds but but there's so many like transitions it's almost like there's a shift every line almost uh, what what is the composition like for for your poems that is in some ways a hard question to answer and i think it depends i think more and more i get a lot of inspiration from reading mm -hmm. i'll kind of go through a particular poet's work that i like and create a, a lexicon i'll pull out individual words that i find really just remarkable or interesting and see how i can work those into a line somewhere and work those perhaps into a poem um and usually that becomes kind of the birth of a piece i think too sometimes it just kind of appears <laughs> i'll be sitting doing something not very important and you know maybe i've been kind of ruminating on a certain idea and, and a line that relates to that will come to me and that that will kind of be the seed that will sprout the work as a whole. Um, and sometimes it's something that can come very rapidly. I think less so now, but I think before I, I feel like I used to be more of a kind of like first try poet. It mm -hmm. would take me a very, very long time to construct a first draft. But once I had that first draft, it was more or less the way that the poem was going to be. Mm -hmm. I I think I do more kind of radical revision, revisions now than I, I used to, granted. Um, but yeah. Well, very cool. Well, let's hear another poem. I want to make sure we, we keep uh, moving through enough. To, I want to get through all of these, and, and there's good stuff here. So what do you want to read next? Okay, let me pull this up on my phone. Um, I'm going to read... And yeah, the, 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 read the one. cutting out thing doesn't happen anymore. So it, it definitely was, the, it will be good on the phone, so... Okay, good to know. Okay. Um, I'll read one from the chat book. Um, <clears throat> dysmorphic disorder. Is both the locust and the once crop mute with locust? Huzzle refracted in ice water. Elegies obeyed, whelping sunrise into nightshades. Bluing the spinal fluid with belladonna drops. The penultimate heartbeat of any small beast slain. The sound smoke makes just before the temple has consented to burn. The sound a howling mouth makes when it makes no sound. Is washing rainwater down the southern bank with snake's blood. Is glass snared, jawless, panicking in a house of angels. Is vision voodooed into ash. Made sackcloth, pantheon, wasteland, slit-winged cherub, fig tree and its mother wound of wasp egg. Is a butterfly rebounding into the valley of death. The evening puzzle daylight is loath to untangle. Is an eclipse mismanaged. Cold splitting totality's circumference along which the starlings murmur in a paranoid language is that language shackling eye to entropy. And that was dysmorphic disorder from um, my name in other languages. I am learning how to speak the chapbook. Um, and, and it's a great example of the experimental kind of style that I was talking about before. And, and I just, I wonder like, where did this idea come from to break the poem, you know, break like words through with those, with those um, slashes and um, and like, like how, like, how do you decide where to do that and what, like, what is this, how did the structure of this poem come to be? It's such an interesting way to lay it out on the page. So um, it was kind of the combination of, so it, it initially began fractured, but not fractured to the same extent that it is fractured. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of between words, not in, in between, well, between individual words, not in the middle of words as it is now. Um, and I, I think for me, working on this particular topic, so much of the idea of it was division and the idea of the, of the separation of the body from the self, the the body becoming kind of a, 
a ma manifestation of the mind's kind of energy, but in quite a negative way, the mind's, the mind's criticisms, the mind's judgments. Mm -hmm. um, and so it felt like to have that kind of fragment, the kind of fracture between things that are meant to be connected, things are, that are supposed to make sense, uh, felt like quite a natural way for it to move. Um, and then I was, I had kind of shown this poem to, to a mentor of mine, um, and she had recommended, you know, why not just go all the way and what would it mean? What would it look like mm -hmm. if you were to make this, you know, even take the words themselves and allow that to, to crumble, to fracture in the same way as you're doing with the lines. Um, and, and I liked it. I really enjoyed the idea. And I think it kind of made the, the sense of it more powerful mm -hmm. to add that certain kind of, cause it makes it a little bit harder to read as yeah. well than mm -hmm. it would be otherwise. And to kind of have the, the difficulty, the emotion also reflected in, in the visuals of it. Um, was something that I quite liked. Yeah. It, there's really interesting way that, um, it reminds me of, um, Aram Saroyan's, um, some of his concrete minimalism work. Like there's, um, there's that, there's a, he has a lot of like one, he's the one who, if, if people, for people know at home, he won an award for writing light with, it's like with two G's and two H's. So it's like spread out. And it was a one word poem that won an award. And then all the conservatives got furious and tried to defund the arts over it. Uh, but one of his poems is, um, I think it's like, um, at night in the garden, creeping a cat. And, and so it's the way that you like realize what it is last. And there's a way that the, that the words function in here because you don't know exactly what's coming. And so there's a way that it like mimics the brain itself, sort of the way that we sort of slowly recognize things. So there's like lines like, um, I don't know, like, like, the, like of angels. Um, you can sort of see out of the corner of your eye that angels is coming, but you're not sure if it's angels or angles until you get there. And so it's sort of like, I don't know, it's a really interesting way. And then so, so talking about dysmorphic disorder, um, it, it's such a great way to represent um, that sort of mental process or something. It, it's just a fascinating way to, to do the poem. I, I really like this one. Thank you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so if anybody has any questions uh, for Marissa, uh, just to remind everybody that you can leave them in the chat windows on either Facebook or YouTube, and I'm watching both. Um, and I'll pass any questions you have along. But uh, let's hear another poem. Okay. Oh, on my phone, rather. Um, so the next one I'm going to read for you all is going to be another one from the chat book, actually. Um, reverse recipe for near impossible feats. And it has kind of an alternate title, which is, or how to grow lavender in the Kentucky wetlands. <clears throat> 10. The warmest hour of the coolest day of a balmy August, lavished with lily and chickweed and madcap mimosa. Clip the modest violet stalks. Dry them on the oak table in the living room, and their scent will ground you through the abstract winter. Nine, pinch off a floret, smear it on your wrist for luck or for rapture or to transport beauty where it has no legs to walk. Eight, a recap of the former. It is easy to forget that beauty is in the recipe. You were 15, your body rounding unstoppably, fresh bloomed and terrible. This is the year you decided not to eat. 7. Know that the tomato plant you grow beside it will dash shapelessly and falter. One sticky noon, you will find seeds speckling the hardwood porch, tunnel-mouthed caterpillars erupting through shrunken carcasses. Let this teach you about loss or patience, or perseverance, or to listen when your grandmother serves you a list of natural pesticides, chili powder, chopped garlic, a solution of unscented oil soap. Six, it is high summer in the river valley, beware the zeal of water, billowing from the twin bellies of the lakes, swelling out of marshes puffed with cattail, the noon air gulps and bulges, blurs with steam. Know that lavender is a plant enamored with drought, sipping only the most astringent light. To save a new growth, parch it in your hope, that crude solar glare. Five, strange moment, strange girl. 
One week ago, you counted six almonds for lunch. It should have been three, so you bit your lip to bleeding. And now you pop the first true buds beneath your tongue without a thought to measured energies. Call this the magnetic property of the earth. Four, pack black fistfuls of soil into the pot. Trouble thread roots with your fingers. Gift a jade stem tomorrow to the dirt sponge tongue. Relish the way light whispers against ruddy terracotta. Notice that it is a shell blue morning, that both moon and sun are perched together in the sky, eight beats on a music sheet. Three, the sun is one month from scraping summit. The sun is one month from scraping summit, and Gemini flares against the pliant dusk. The time has come to prepare the dwelling. Draw up again the misplaced metal of your girlhood. Two. This is a wet and feverish season. You are 15, oak-thighed and drowning. But do not forget that your arms will haul soil and clay. Lungs will ward off humidity's noose. Legs will carry pots back and forth in pursuit of the loudest rays of a waning day. A life will hinge on the vibrancy of your body. Your own two hands must defy all the pulp and sweat of summer. You must begin to be brazen. One. Believe these dry land blooms may be the spell to save you. Cradle sun and seeds in the comma of your palm. Inhale their spice. Absorb their pluck. Persist. And that was reverse recipe for near impossible feats or How to Grow Lavender in Kentucky, in the Kentucky Wetlands. Uh, once again, from my name in other languages, I am learning how to speak. Um, so so um, you're in the Appalachian Poets issue, and uh, maybe this is a good time to talk about, a good transition to talk about um, what, what, it felt, what it feels like to be an Appalachian poet. Um, how much do you identify with the region, and, and what was it like growing up there? So it's funny, I'm... I'm Appalachian more by birth than I am by actual where I grew up. So I'm from Western Kentucky, which mm-hmm. is not the mountainous side. It's it's the River Valley, um, the intersection of the Ohio, the Mississippi, the Tennessee, and I think one other remember one other that I can never remember. Um, but both of my parents are from Ironton, Ohio, which is a mm-hmm. small town in like the tri-state of Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia. Um, and so it's where all of my family is. My grandparents are most of my aunts and uncles. The couple are in Columbus, but mostly based in Ironton um, and where we always spent holidays growing up. And so it's, for me, it's this, this funny kind of back and forth between the, the two places that both have a hold on me and a sense of identification um, and a sense of, I think it, they're both landscapes that hold a certain kind of emotional hold on me. Mm-hmm. Um, both the kind of the hills, you know, I can see in my head when I was like, going home to my to my my grandparents and you can see the hills kind of rising all around the city and almost kind of like a a dome um and then like back home it's more kind of we have the forest right behind my house we have the the, the rivers and the creeks um, more kind of the water is more kind of present texture um but yeah i there it's it's two ways i think of thinking of home um and it's interesting because even though my parents are from Ohio, technically, it's it's basically a, it's a 10 minute drive from the Kentucky border. Mm-hmm. And so in some ways, it's kind of a, a heritage of Kentucky, but in kind of opposite senses. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's um, I don't know that the uh, the thing that I that doing the issue sort of stood out to me so much was the, the sense of sort of family narrative and, and the sort of storytelling. There's sort of it seems to be like a natural um you know, tendency towards storytelling in the culture, which came out really well in, in poetry. Do you think like f- family stories kind of shaped your, the way you go about writing poems? Is that something that, that, you know, mattered a lot to you growing up? In a certain way. I, I think I, I kind of smiled when you said storytelling because it's very, in my family, my grandpa in particular, I feel like there's such a, a sense of kind of oral history yeah exactly I can also that's come what across i'm trying to like, yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah sometimes it's kind of gossipy you know as far as my grandfather is concerned he knows this the story of every single person that has ever lived in ireton ohio for the past probably three generations everyone my parents went to high school with everyone he went to high school with everyone that his parents you know grew up with um but it is a sense of like 
there's a sense of, of preservation and a sense of the strength of community too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. That there is a sense of like the webs are so tightly knit and, and tightly understood. Um, and I think a, a sense of like what of like everyone's story is something worth remembering. Everyone's story is one kind of kind of piece of of the overall quilt that's being built. Um, and yeah. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. That that there's a this a quilt that's being built. That's a great metaphor because that's exactly how it felt. It felt like um, I don't know that that that, that was just a central aspect of of what of the of the culture there that's maybe different. It's interesting that we um you know we do these themes um for the issues and we have no idea what we're going to get and then the interesting thing is like we just put out a call and try to spread the word and then see what kind of pattern emerges from that. And, and that was really the pattern that, that came from from the Appalachian issue. And it, it ended up being one of our favorite issues we've ever done. It was really, uh, I think, great poetry throughout. Um, how has it been, you know, moving out of, um, you know, the Western Kentucky area, which is less Appalachia, but then to New York City and then to Paris? Um, like, like what? where do you feel like like is home? Like, where do you feel like you fit the best? Like, like one, <laughs> one question I saw just recently on Facebook, someone was like, um, you know, where's the one place where you showed up, you felt like home immediately or something? Is there a way that like a big city feels that way? Or um, are you sort of still looking for that? Or do you love going back? Or how does, since you've been all over the place, how... Um, you know, what feels like home? I feel like that's a a question I'm still kind of trying to figure out in mm-hmm. a lot of ways. Um, I I think Paris feels like home in a lot of ways to me. And I think being back here again in a somewhat long term is making me realize how much that's true. It was also it was the first place that I kind of went after college. Mm-hmm. So I, I, went, I did college in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, then I moved here directly after to, for, for the job that I took on in the schools. And... So it was the first place that I kind of experienced an, an independent and adult life. Um, I, I built a very strong community here, people that I, are incredibly close to me. Um, and I think just like figuring out life on one's own in a place kind of gives one a very, you know, very difficult in a lot of ways, but also a very strong connection to it. Mm-hmm. This is the place that I, I feel like I, I know better than a lot of other places. Um, perhaps know best in, in some ways. Um, Kentucky is is still home in its own way as well, but in a different sense, it's the place that I'm always happy to go back to. Um, but I, it's it's a harder situation in the sense of just what there is for me as an adult there. You know, most of the people that I grew up with don't mm-hmm. live there anymore. Um, yeah. My high school friends will maybe come over the holidays. Maybe that connects to what your last question was. Perhaps a sense of the storytelling is because there can be a sense of of gradual loss with just like urbanization and people moving out of, of the countryside and places like the Appalachian region. And so perhaps this is a storytelling too, is to, to save the sense of, of what in some ways is kind of dispersing. Mm-hmm. Um, but and that aside, um, it, it, I feel like still the, for me, when I think of Kentucky and I think of what it means as, as home, it's not necessarily it, it is in a lot of ways this, the town of Paducah, but mm-hmm. I actually grew up outside of Paducah in a kind of even smaller connected town called Reedland. Um, and I kind of grew up in the countryside. We don't really have neighbors. We have like one neighbor that's like on the hill, like next to us. Uh-huh. Um, and so when I imagine home, it's more like I imagine the forest. I imagine like going hiking through it on Christmas day with my sister and my grandmother. I, I imagine, you know, watching the kind of the wildlife, the, the animals run through, um, watching the dogs play. It's more the sense of of the natural space that mm-hmm. that feels like the home to me than a sense of like a connection to the town. Um, since most of the people that I know there, I don't aren't present anymore. Um, yeah, New York, I, I wouldn't really say counts as it's where uh-huh. I live and uh, where I unfortunately <laughs> pay a lot of rent. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's I also I, I moved there not too long before the pandemic happened, so I haven't really had a chance to sink any kind of roots there. Um, I had a really great time at my MFA and met a lot, a lot of amazing people, um, but it's it's not the city that feels like I, I have much of a, a personal connection to it otherwise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that, just, that whole thing you're talking about with the storytelling and the, and the sense of place, it just makes me think of there's something really sad that's going on now with just sort of the loss of regional culture. You know, like mm-hmm. like it started with TV, really, as we sort of lose accents because you know, everybody on TV speaks the same sort of dialect. Um, but then you sort of lose as people, you know, spread around and, and 
everything's sort of homogenized in a way that there are few places that have unique cultures it seems like um uh, and uh, I don't know. Do you feel that way? Like, like when you're when you say that you're in in Paris, feels most like home. Is there something that's unique about Paris culture that um, is different than other places? Like, I don't know. Is there something to it that it's a, it just feels like we're getting more and more the same? <laughs> <laughs> I I see what you're saying. Um, as far as what's different about about Paris culture, a, a lot of things. <laughs> I feel like in some ways hard to even put into words. Um, I, I feel like here, I mean, there are a lot of things that drive me crazy about being here as well. I, w- I will mm-hmm. say up front, um, drive me absolutely insane sometimes. But I think one of the things that I do really love about it is that there's more of a sense of, of importance placed on often taking time for the self, taking time for one's loved ones and families. Um, American is a culture can be very, it, I don't want to say workaholic, but mm. maybe that's what I, I mean. Um, very kind of productivity focused, very, what am I, I've got to like hustle. I've got to grind all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the mark of like my, not just my success, but like my worth sometimes, you know, yeah. um, I feel like here, you know, when I worked in the schools, for example, we had two hour lunch breaks. So we had two hour lunch breaks so that the kids could go home and eat with our families every single day oh, if wow. they wanted to. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of importance placed on like the idea of like, it's a critical part of a child's like, education and, and or not education but like their, their growth process to be able to have that time with their loved ones with with their their parents and their siblings um for that kind of emphasis to be like even institutionalized already feels like kind of an important thing yeah yeah um whereas i had like 30 minutes lunch in high school you know uh-huh. <laughs> i'm a really yeah. sweet eater so it, like it was hard <laughs> um but i mean that kind of thing i i feel like i, I really appreciate it when I, when I was here um Especially since I myself can often tend towards a workahol- workaholic. So mm-hmm. it's, I think, nice to be in a place that allows me to kind of set that aside some. Um, I also just, I really love the la- I really like speaking French. I love living in the language. Um, like, that is a huge appeal for me, is just the chance to, like, to, to practice that um, mm-hmm. as often as possible, slash all the time, if I so choose. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, as far as regional culture goes... Yeah, I, it's interesting. It's interesting what you're saying as, as far as like how, you know, media and it's just you have things like mm-hmm. TikTok and like the Internet, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. that yeah. kind of things go viral and become memes and like the kind of same cultural pieces kind of spread around. And what does that mean for like a kind of regionality is, I think, a really interesting question. Yeah, it seems like it's just getting lost, I think, a little bit. I, I remember I, I haven't traveled much, um, but when I went to Spain, um, I landed in Barcelona and then we drove past a Toys R Us. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, why? Why? Like, like, why can't there be a different toy store in, in Barcelona? You know, I, I don't know. There's just something about it that, that feels sad that we're losing, losing something. And so, so having a, an issue like an Appalachian Poets issue kind of highlights that in a way. Like that's, you know, it's, it's one of the places that still has a culture that's a little bit different. Um, but but yeah, it, it's interesting the workaholicness um, that you were talking about before too. Um, I want to talk more about translation, but first let's read another poem. Um, okay. What do you want to read next? Um, I think I have "If We Had Known" up next on my my papers. Okay. Um, so this is actually about Kentucky. Um, right or actually anything. Any Kentuckians that are listening will immediately recognize the the topic. So, <clears throat> if we had known. Someone would have said to buy kerosene. Someone would have said, fell the trees, if only the ancients, or the birds, they have gone oddly still, hardly breathing in those branches clean as the bones on a glutton's plate. Or asked, what on earth do the bats want crying like that? And why is every small life fleeing? Mother, Knowing such long still is a kind of vertigo, would have made us all pray our travelers' mercies. And father, raised by women, would have spared the hillside's elder crabapple, guessed we wouldn't perish for it. If we in the town had been called out our doors by some autumn prophet, she would have warned us, what come years break, watch for crystal, watch for stars to spatter in the distance, for sky to recover such immaculate black, it will make you clean as birth. 
the stars which would not be stars, but transformers bursting. Brief contagion of fireworks bluing the low horizon, flashing down to barrenness. The barrenness, what remained? Like a pharaoh somewhere had talked his way into a grave mistake. First beauty, fugitive, then the pines falling everywhere, everywhere, common as the skins of a future summer cicadas, common as the mysteries that claw out of clouds' bellies like another world spawn. And that gleam, that weight, implausible. The sycamores opaled and shimmered and cracked and plunged, and the oak branches swayed and stung the power lines, and the maples ice mauled through fatal shapes on the county roads, islanded Benton from Reedland, Paducah from Possum Trot, Lone Oak from Atomic Ballard, every family from every other family, forcing us close to our visible breath, to dark and water, something like a womb but treacherous, less transparent than the beast of summer, which we did know every year would have us in yellow mania, vaulting drought and flood. But in this, our tender southern winter, we had believed home something more solid than a warbler's nest. Harder fight for clouds whim. Some days one knows while living them were already written in apocryphal gospels. So close to diamond, that judgment warping over the branches of the birch trees of magnolia restless for martyrdom. Metamorphosis of world into glass and our reflections grew dense and lucid in us. Glass into vengeance, and we noted then the purpose, a first expression of something unnameable, unnameable but solid, yes, so tangible, it could crack us all like a twig in its hand. It's another beautiful new poem, and that was um, If, I, if We Had Known, um, from... Has it been published anywhere yet? No, it's waiting for a home. <laughs> okay, well, if, there, if anybody wants it, there it is. Um, so, do, do, what are you like working on next? Like, what is your? Um, do you, are you working on a full length collection? Because this the, this is a chapbook. I don't know if I mentioned that, but this is a chapbook, so it's a, a slender collection. Do you have any uh, a full length like in progress that that's making the rounds? Yeah, I just sent out on the 30th for the first time um, my full length manuscript to a, to a contest. I'm going to send to a couple more over the course of the next couple of months. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I have basically what my thesis was, um, mm -hmm. plus expanded and, and refined over the past couple of months, several months, really. Um, and I've kind of packaged that into a whole big thing. And that's now what will hopefully at some point become a book. <laughs> yeah, well, I have no doubt that it will. And probably probably very soon, probably this round of, of submissions, I bet. Um, <laughs> Um, so I did want to talk about translation a little bit because you do, I don't think we included a translation here, um, in the poems you sent, but, um, but you do do a lot of translation all from the French, I assume, right? Yes. And, and so, so what draws you to do that work? I think it's really important work to be translating poems and, and sharing it with bigger audiences. So what, what drew you to that and, 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 and like, and what do you get out of it? So initially when I first started translating, it was more just language practice. And I was translating usually my own poetry into French hmm. as kind of a revision tool, mm -hmm. then translate it back into English and see, you know, as kind of a way of like, is this word precise enough? Is this meaning exactly what I, I meant for it to mean? Um, and I paying enough attention to like how the language is like moving here. Um, what are the kind of bones of this and what, what makes this poem what it, what it is? Um, and so it was more kind of a, a practice really. Um, but I, so my first year here in Paris, I was working as a language assistant, which is only like 12 hours a week. You make zero money. I ate a lot of cabbage and lentils and spent a lot of time just running around museums and libraries. Um, and so I would, I would hang out in off in the poetry section and I had like relatively little, you know, much as I was saying earlier, so much of like poetic education is often historical things. I had relatively little exposure to contemporary French poetry. Um, so I'd look through, look through books and, and read and just kind of get a sense of what it was. Um, and then sometimes I would just be so just enamored with the work that it's, I feel like there's this pool to like, I have other people, people that I know, I want them to also experience this work. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. 
I, I wish that I could show this to this friend or this friend or this friend, but they wouldn't have no idea what it means. Um, and so I, you know, I, I get have those very long lunch breaks of like two hours and sometimes I would take part of them and then start, you know, translating poems. Um, and like I had, you know, friends that I, that were coworkers of mine that would help me when I had trouble with the word. And so it kind of just became a, a practice. And after a certain amount of time, I decided why not try submitting some to magazines and such. Um, but I think really what, what I get out of the, the act of translation is a, this, this joy of like, the joy of my discovery, my discovery becoming something that, that can then be discovered by others. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that like this work is contributing also something to my own understanding of poetry, what poetry is and can do and can mean. Um, because, you know, different places and different languages have different sensibilities and different ways, different approaches. And, you know, French is the language that rhymes relatively easily compared to English, for example. Um, and that changed the way that like music is approached in, in, in like rhythm is approached in French works. Um, and then just, I don't know, just various kind of paying attention to even individual poets and, and the kind of things that they would teach me. Mm -hmm. um, not even on like kind of a larger cultural level, but just like what my interaction with particular poets work then kind of gave gave to my understanding of, of poetry as a whole, um, which is a really exhilarating and really fun experience and yeah. remains that. Yeah, how, how much um, would you say like a translation is is you and how much is the poet? I always think about um, Montale, because I love Eugenio Montale. Um, I found a, a translation, uh, Charles Wright's um, translation is the first one that I came across of Montale. And um, I love that book, The Storm and Other Poems. And, um, and then I saw and read another translation. Of, I think it was like I had a, there was a whole bunch of poems in one translation by Aerosmith. And, um, and I didn't like, it was like so flat. I mean, sorry, no offense to Aerosmith. I, maybe it was more <laughs> literal or I'm not sure, but I, I came to realize comparing the two that there was just a lot of Charles Wright in the Mandali translation and um, which sort of made it come to life in English in a way that being a little more literal maybe didn't. Um, and so there's that, we had a series um, by Art Beck and, and when we were doing um, online essays called The Impertinent Duet, which is what he called translation. Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing a duet um, with the original author. And, um, and, and it's sort of hard to avoid putting yourself in there too. Do you, do you, how do you think about that uh, when it comes to translating? Do you, do you, is that something you worry about or do you let that happen? And um, just how do you think about that? I mostly let it happen. I think because I initially started translating just as, as a me thing and not for fun. I think mm -hmm. I just kind of, I allowed a certain amount of myself to also be part of the work. I think to a certain extent, as you were saying with the Charles Wright and Aerosmith, it's kind of necessary. Um, if you translate just literally word for word, you're not doing, you're not giving the poem its due. Mm -hmm. you, you have to, I think, put something of your own spirit in it, something of your own sensibilities in it for it to be capable of being rendered both accurately, but also you know, poetically, also artistically and lyrically and language that it's going to become part of. Um, and so it's important, of course, to be faithful to the author's intentions and to understand, you know, how you can can work that into the kind of, into what it's becoming. Um, and to, you know, not go too crazy with it. It's not, at the end of the day, it's not your mm -hmm. poem. Um, but also, you know, I play around a lot with like line breaks. I play around, around a lot with like stanza breaks. I play around sometimes with like, you know, with, with how imagery is being construed, um, for it's a way that I feel like it, it would work better in English, um, as opposed to just rendering it what it is exactly. Um, and I, I feel like it's an important step, um, to be, for, for it to become what it, what it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, so at the end of the day, if you're just trying to make it, you know, exactly what it is in the, in the original language, it's going to just end up being something that's, actually quite unfaithful, I think, to the original mm -hmm. um, and trying too hard to be too close to it, in, in my opinion. It, I think it's required to have some level of of one's own, you know, self, one's own, one's own kind of what it means, I guess, to kind of thread a poem together mm -hmm. as part of that. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's just such a complicated balance that you have to work, I think. Yeah. Um, do, is there any is a certain poet that you translate enough where where you're on the verge of maybe having a whole book in translation? Is is there is that something that's on your radar, or do you just think about individual poems? I 
And the poet I've translated most has been Aksinia Mihailova. Mm -hmm. She's actually Bulgarian um, by by birth and lives in Bulgaria now. She's a, she's alive. She's a contemporary mm -hmm. poet. Yeah. Um, and a translator in her own right, actually, she translates from I think Bulgarian to French and as well as some other languages. Um, and so she's the one that I've translated the most of. Not quite a whole book, but mm -hmm. probably by this point, I get maybe half of it. Yeah. Um, I'm not necessarily thinking right now. I mean, I would I would certainly consider you know translating and and maybe the entire collection mm -hmm. and maybe seeing if it can like find a home as in its entirety in English would be I think a quite amazing thing. Um, but I haven't like actively, I guess, started pursuing that yeah. at this point. Yeah, that 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 seems like a niche that that's really not filled. Like if I was starting a literary magazine from scratch, I would love to do like a translation review, and there should be a small press that's just a translation press too. Um, you know, there are a few things that that do similar things, but I think it's just something that there's not enough of, in in my opinion. Um, there was a question from Richard Westheimer, which is something that I kind of wanted to ask, too. He says, does the, does the music and settled meanings of the French language find its way into your poetry? So how, how does it work in reverse? That's a good question. I feel like it, it definitely does. I remember when I was, um, I, I have a kind of a, a, a mentor in, in poetry, um, Danica Kelly, who has been very kind since I was an undergrad. To, to look at some of my work from time to time and give me feedback. And I remember at some point, after I'd been in France, or maybe I'd get six months to a year, um, sending her some work. And she was like, some of these constructions are like a little bit strange. And I realized looking back at it, it was because I was, French is such a kind of recursive language, especially in its colloquial speech. It says the subject, you know, says what it wants to say, then says the subject again. And mm -hmm. I had begun like kind of writing like that oh, accidentally. <laughs> it wasn't a very functional way to write. It just kind of became, I kind of had to wean myself off of it. Um, but I mean, I think like that's one example of, of definitely, yes, French finds its way and the rhythms of French find its way um, into my work, sometimes in ways that I like and sometimes in ways that, that I don't. Um, but it's there regardless. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Very cool. OK, well, um, so I'm looking at the clock and look at the poems we have left. And I haven't been doing a good enough job of keeping you on poems. So let's do like two poems. Let's read the okay. next two. I want to make sure we get to all these. Um, so the next one is another new one. Memory of Mammoth Cave, provoked by a pelvic ultrasound. You'll hear three sounds created by the blood rushing through the uterus. The uterus is made of several muscles. And the blood moving through each gives a different music. In the whitewashed office, instruments of unusual revelation. The organ translated aimed to stain me, gleaned the glossolalia from the waves. Low throbs of an amphibian throat or the Methuselah creep of groundwater. Once, as a girl, I touched the dew of groundwater. A wanton palimpsest, that labyrinth which all birth imitates. I bore witness. The way gypsum leaps from cave walls is a brightness like a sound. And bright, this black attest its roots, glow, gleam, absolute. I was a child. I trembled, realizing I had already lived. The organ knows. The organ tells on itself calls me a side effect of time, an accident. Small lives living separately as one. Failure and shed, sex and red revival, minor frisson of apoptosis and the cell's wet gasping splits. I bore witness, a primordial darkness, dense as the nerve's charge that originates all thought. The descent less a mimicry of death than a vision of death bound to its opposite. A serpent skinning. I, plurality and accidental, creature cording high and low kingdoms. A trinity roars sharp from my blood wet gut. Louder than I was ever told that cosmos of hidden rivers. I bore witness in the hollows of Anta Black to make the head whirl as consummate as God's passing back, which I and under earth commune with. 
which exhales and is sentient. And was, poem number two. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, that was memory of mammoth cave provoked by a pelvic ultrasound. Um, okay, let's do the next one too. Okay. <clears throat> this is self-portrait as Persephone. And this is an older one. This is in the chat book. I am afraid of his long man's body. The way it creeps toward me in the gray marrow of the night, the way I yearn for it to slit me open like a blade does a soft fruit. This is what my mother warned me about when I was young and still combed my hair with poplar twigs and ran barefoot between the rising yellow grains that looked like sun rays and spun the sun rays into life. My navel then still smooth and smelling like blue milk. My head like sweat and sweet almond oil. When my mother labored against my wild down, bridled it flat to my scalp. As if that meant I would not shiver towards the mouths of beast or lay my body flat against the earth and trail my nose across it, my lips and yes, my tongue, pretending it was. Oh, I do not know what I pretended that it was. But in the endless summer, how the tree fruits puffed and tumbled when fell sunken half moons. And I remember how the sun heat turned their meat and the air surged syrup sharp, nap thick. Each month, I ate just one from the ground, thinking this is what it will be like to be a woman, nectar in my mouth overflowing, acid sugar mold sour light. But that was before I licked the honey blood from arrows, before inside my cavern abdomen, hunger burst open what strange and tender poppy. Before my mother's howls snapped the land to crystal, now I align with winter, clinging to the dark, its swell, its tightening cold. And taking this man, my mouth a resurrection, so lush an animal, my plump body sharp against his seams, I rename night emergence, rename myself, bloom, beast, knife. And that was uh, Self-Portrait as Persephone from the chapbook, My Name in Other Languages, I'm Learning How to Speak. Um, one of the things I want to ask about was just the, the, the this chapbook in particular is so much about, um, you know, the body and sexuality and like personal identity. Do you ever like, th like think about how vulnerable you feel on the page, like writing about self in that, in that way? Um, is that something that you even consider or is it something um, like, how do you think about that? It's not something that I consider when I'm writing the poems. Mm -hmm. It is something that I consider afterwards, <laughs> such as when I was putting together the list of things I was going to read for, for this even. I was going through and I was like, oh man, this is a lot of really <laughs> personal stuff for me to talk about for an hour with, with who knows who's watching. Um, and I remember when, when the, the chat book first came out being in, in some ways incredibly nervous about everything. I mean, it, it's it's one thing I think to to talk a lot about my myself and things that I've gone through and the ways that I understand the world. But sometimes I, I bring family into it and that feels like to what extent is that an, an invasion of their privacy um, and, and other kind of such things I think can, can make it quite complicated. And I, I still to this day don't allow a lot of my family to read my poetry. Mm -hmm. They do anyway. <laughs> uh -huh. But I mean, even when, when my, my chat book came out, I was, it was during the pandemic, I was back home in Kentucky um, I received a copy. I think they sent the main copies to my Brooklyn apartment, but they sent me one to, to my house um, so that I could read it because I didn't know at that point when I'd be back in Brooklyn. Um, it was kind of back early pandemic when everything was going crazy. No one knew anything. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't tell my family that I had it. I didn't tell them about my lunch reading. I told my friends and, and you know, my, my college friends, my, my grad school friends, my high school friends. Um, but I, I remember like when I, I finally did manage to go back to New York, you know, I told my parents, cause they knew that I, I had it, they knew that I had won it and they mm -hmm. wanted to read it. Um, I was like, I'm going to leave it on the mantle. Mm -hmm. You can read it when I'm on the plane, <laughs> <laughs> um, not a moment before. 
and I don't want you to ever speak to me about anything that's in it, and mm-hmm. that's going to be our deal. Oh, wow. Um, and and they're, you know, they're very kind about it. I, I know they Google my name and find things whenever they, they feel like it. It's all like in public, and they know what my name is, so you know, they mm-hmm. know how to find me when they want to. Um, but they are, I think, really kind about respecting my, my privacy otherwise in it. Um, because it is, I think, I, I think it's easier to be open in some ways with, with strangers for me yeah. than it is to be open with, with, I, I think maybe close friends is a different matter, but certainly with family members. Um, and I think when I, when I write, I just, I just write, I, I write what I need to write at that moment. Um, and what I want to write at that moment. And then it's kind of the after effect of like, okay, what am I going to do with this poem? If I want to put it in the world, like, what does that mean? And do I even bother putting it in the world? Maybe I just, maybe it's just for me. And some poems are like that. Um, so yeah, it is, I think, a, a, a constant negotiation of mm-hmm. how do I, now that this thing exists and it's in the world, you know, what do I make of that? And, and how do I, you know, move myself around that in that space if, if that's needed? And sometimes it's complicated, but for the most part, I manage. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's a great, um, you know, a great rule is that you can read this, but we'll never speak of it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, I think you know, a lot of poets should probably adopt that because, you know, poetry are writing about trying to figure out the, the issues that we're going through in life. You know, that's kind of what poetry is. And, and it is easier to be honest about that with strangers a lot of the times, which is why, like, you know, therapists work and things like that, you know? So, um, yeah, have they have they followed up, you know, followed through on that rule? Do they not mention it? Yeah, yeah, they, they are really good about that. You know, mm-hmm. I, I know they tell me that they read my work, but they mm-hmm. don't actively, you know, talk to me, thankfully, yeah. about my work. Um, my dad sometimes I was just like, he's a lot of big words. I don't really understand it. I'm like, okay, so much better. <laughs> like, yeah. like, that's exactly what I hoped he would say. <laughs> uh-huh. yeah. um, but yeah. I mean, I think they're, they're really, you know, they're, they're very proud of me and mm-hmm. they, they care a lot about what I do. Um, but they're also, I think, very good about, about respecting the boundaries that, that I ask for, which I, pre- I'm really grateful for that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, they, they, they read everything, but we they're good about you know not bringing any of it up to me <laughs> yeah that's a great rule i think we're gonna have to steal that <laughs> <laughs> um well we're coming up on time i think there's two more poems you want to read do you want to do you want to finish are. with both do you have time to do both even though they go a little bit over let's do it okay okay um so the next one i want to read is actually the one that that rattle published for the appalachian issue um another persephone poem because i was a 16 year old who liked sylvia plath i think it goes in the same territory um Katavasis. Persephone recollects. Can you, you know, before um, before you read it, because I have trouble keeping the the Greek myths straight, and yes. um, and 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 Persephone is one that that you know is is pretty common in poetry. But just ex- can you explain a little bit about it, just for for listeners who don't know the story, so that because we had a, we already had a Persephone poem too, uh, like like how is I know we should just be reading poems, but <laughs> but how does can you explain the story a little bit and say and why you relate to it a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so the Persephone story, um, Persephone, so she's a, a goddess. She's her. She's the daughter of the goddess Demeter. Um, she is out picking flowers in a field, I think maybe with some friends, maybe not. Um, she gets kidnapped by Hades, the god of hell, uh, the god of the, uh, the underworld, the afterlife. Um, and he takes her to the underworld with him. Um, this is a very kind of rapid summary, by the way. Um, so she is supposed to say there, she is given, a, I think, a palm full of pomegranates to eat, pomegranate arrows to eat. She ends up eating half of them, which means that she ends up staying just half of the year down there and, and half, you know, up in the world of the living. Her mother, Demeter, you know, while she's gone and doesn't know what's happened to her, she, she searches the whole world for her. Um, this is the, So basically, this is the origin story of winter, is, is that kind of the idea. She searches the whole world world for, for her daughter, um, cannot find her, eventually is able to get her back because of this whole deal with the arrows. I think she also works out some negotiation with, with maybe Zeus. I don't quite recall the, all the small details. Um, but because Persephone goes back to the underworld half of the time, um, when her mother is grieving her loss, that's when autumn and winter happen. And when Persephone comes back and her mother is glad again, that is why spring and summer happen. Mm-hmm. Um, and why I relate to this story is in some ways a complicated question and one that I myself am maybe still trying to work through. Mm-hmm. Um, I think 
Uh, some of the some of it is, I think, the 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 nuances of the mother daughter relationship, um, and the ways in which that speaks to me. Um, I think as someone who ha- has dealt with like certain things with mental health in the past, um, kind of this, the feeling of like, and I think watching when you're dealing with those things, it's painful, of course, to go through it. It's also painful to watch others watching you go through it. Mm-hmm. And there's a sense of guilt, I think, that's attached to that. Mm. Um, and I, I think this idea of like one's descent and the mother's grief, I think is something that that speaks to me quite intensely. Um, and I have another poem that is, it's a long one, not worth reading here. And it's like a, a two voice poem. And it, it's, it kind of deals with, with that relationship with the mother and the daughter and has Demeter and Persephone speaking back to each other um, over her, her return to hell. Um, and so I think that's kind of the, it was the initial draw for me, but the other things I kind of draw of it, out mm-hmm. of it as well. And I think there are some readings of, of Persephone's kidnap and some kind of like rather maybe liberal interpretations of it as not a kidnapping, but perhaps like, what if she went willingly? And what if this is just like a metaphor for like female discovery of sex and sexuality? Um, and so that kind of gets mm-hmm. wrapped up into it too. And I think the idea of those kind of things as being, I grew up in the Bible belt, that kind of thing is, as being quite taboo. And what does it mean to kind of like push in some way back against that? I think interests me. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a great, great explanation. Um, yeah, it's one of those poems where I remember at the meeting where we were talking about whether or not to publish it, we, you, you had to pull out Google. And, and so Catabasis is the is the descent to the underworld that march down and, and back. And then, it, you know, then it has a has some military meaning that came off of that, I guess. Um, and then we have to look up the, you know, is, is Persephone that one? You know, that's kind of <laughs> the way it always goes for me. And we're kind of like, fine, pull out your phone, and then we figure it out. And then, but so um, it really illuminates the poem to to know that story a little bit. So um, so thanks for taking the time to, to explain that. Um, why don't you go ahead? I'll, I'll put it back up. Okay. <clears throat> Catabasis. Persephone recollects. In a dream... Cold rains falling in reverse out the autumn earth. I felt my body and my body was salt water. I helped a doe loose a fawn from itself, branch its flesh, surrender half its heaviness to sun and breath with a force as hot and mute as lightning but the child. I held it in my hands. The child was stillborn. In a dream, I touched my loneliness. I smelled it. It had the texture of unkempt wool, the scent of semen, and I decided to keep it. The land turned to dust under my feet. I took off my sandals, tried to teach myself to step with lightness, tried to kiss the hurt from its stone face, but even my mouth was a kind of acid. Under earth, I braided my hair with lanolin, let my coils riot like roots. I believed my own end, no cruelty. Every soul learned winter's bite but me, and I was happy. No, no, I was not happy. I wanted to run through the storm-soaked fields again and see cold branches standing naked as a man and tell my mother I'm sorry for our twin sorrows. I wanted to shout my own name over and over. For once, it felt like a strawberry on my tongue, that firm and real, and I could taste the memory of ambrosia. Oh God, it was there. It was mine again. See, death is a kind of longing, just as longing is a kind of death. I am learning to love myself a little better here. And that means knowing what I deserved. I deserved something much brighter than this. In a dream, the history I am made of is not the history I am made of. I am neither a sin nor a series of endings, as I won't be. In that world, I never staggered under sour blood beads of pomegranate. Maybe there is even no such thing. So when I look in the mirror, all I see is my life performing the very action of life. 
my face more than a face, a consummation and a radical, a nucleus, a wellspring. I never wanted to wake up, but the earth taught me many things, including the necessity of closing a parenthesis, including that it is possible to survive one's own death though you must be altered. I could almost die for wanting me. All this light, my blue heart thrashes like a fish. Yeah, I just love that ending. That was Catabasis from uh, the summer issue of Rattle. And uh, let's close it out with the last poem. All right. <clears throat> and the last one is called Union. You were only plucking hyacinth. Spring gnashing over you. An urgency, a greed. Wounded by new brightness, the sudden gore of its own empty. This, the beginning of knowledge. Birth commanded your mother outward. Her hands blooded echoes of the black land. Her hands, obedience made flesh. Lifelines heavy slung with tulip bulb. Nearby, child you, child sitting, crisscross to cross the unchild earth. You watched surrender without seeing it. Until you were only, you were only. You sniffed the flower, decided rashly, mashed its skin into yours. Broken stems, a salt of sticky milk. Oil seeping, leaping, sprouting fang, puncturing your plum small wrist. This, the destruction of the body. Annihilation of limit. Disparate forces flowing as one, or a singular force shaped disparately. Promiscuity of essence, substance. You could smell it in you now. Its blood, your blood dissolving, rising, until new, thick-breathed, you shuddered into your warm, divisible elements. Once oriole, once fungus, gold down, torn light, mycelium. Weren't you, right then, also tulip bulb and the hard dirt warming it? Also persimmon, rotting also in the weeds, also frenzy, tangled mercy, bull thistle razoring the wind, also without lack, as earth, immune to ruin, being that earth and the everything that rages through earth, knowing exactly what it is, exactly what it is owed. March and the south air already deep as river. You awoke burning in the belly of it, a small thing suspended in her own without beginning, without end and your mother nearby, oblivious to how loud you did not scream. Your mother, close-lipped, eaten with toil, something in her sirening. From the earth, you can own nothing, not even yourself. Perhaps it was the sweat her body leaked onto the peeling bulbs. You saw it, something of her flowing down and born and buried and already lashing upward with them. And that was Union by Marissa Davis. Thanks so much, Marissa, for being a guest. It's a pleasure talking to you and, and sharing your poems. And They're the kind of poetry that um, just makes like words like a fire in your brain, all those great you know, things you put together, the, the images and the and surprising twist at every turn. Um, great to hear. Thanks so much for being a guest. It was great to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. It's been a joy. I appreciate it. Yep. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Bye. Bye. Yes, that was Marissa Davis uh, in her chat book, um, which I'll put on screen here, is um, My Name in Other Languages, I'm Learning How to Speak. And it's available from um, Jai Alai Books. It won the um, Kaveh Kanem Prize. You can find more of um, or actually, the Toy Derricote and Tor Cornelius Edie chapbook prize and um, you can find more of marissa's work at her website which is of course um let me see there it is it's, it's marissa hyphen davis um 
Marissa-Davis.com. Marissa-Davis.com is our website, so a lot of these poems are there. Um, you can order the chapbook through a link at that website. My name in other languages, I am learning how to speak. And um, so we're going to be moving on now to the open lines. So let me put this up really quick and we will get to that. Um, that's not the right one. Where's the right one? There's the instructions. So uh, first, if you haven't yet, email your poems to openmic at rattle.com. That's openmic at rattle.com. I'll be able to show them on the screen that way. Then pick one or the other. You can either call in over video by Skype and in Skype alone. Just uh, log into Skype, type Rattle Poetry into the search bar. I, um, you know, will come up. You can send me a chat message and say hi, and that's how you get on the uh, list. I'll go talk to anybody in the order the uh, people will receive. That's how you sign up for the open mic. The other way is to call by phone, 818-850-7727. That's 818-850-7727. Just call, let it ring a few times and hang up, and I will call you back when the time is right. Either way, when I do call you back, um, as soon as I call and you say hello, turn off your stream wherever you're watching it. It's like one of those old radio shows where there's a delay and the delay will be confusing. So like the old radio host used to say, turn off your, turn down your radio. Uh, do that before we uh, start talking to me and only talk to me through your phone. Otherwise, it'll be a little bit confusing. Um, but we can do um, prop poems. We can do um, news poems. We can do uh, anything you want to share. And that'll be open the lines in just a moment. I'm going to take a quick break and be right back as I get this set up. And I'm back. Thanks for letting me uh, stand up and stretch a little bit and get these poems set up. Let's see, who do we have so far? So we'll definitely do Julian Matthews first um, and Nivity to Karthik because we didn't get to them last week. Um, last week the show went as far as I can go for, for time pretty much. And we, we didn't get to a bunch of people. So we'll make sure we get to uh, Nivedita and Julian Matthews first. Then we have uh, Richard Westheimer. We got Carlton Johnson. Ted Govera sent a poem. Jose Gonzalez um mike bales oh we also missed mike bales so we'll, the first yeah last week we missed mike mike bales too so we'll get um mike in two hopefully and we have a first time caller at 862 so we'll get to that them for sure and then we'll get to um the other people too oh carlos schwartz is here so we got a lot of people uh, mike bales yeah there we go so let's call up first oh wait <laughs> but before we do um uh, the prompt and all that stuff um the prompt for this week was to um um, to Autumn by John Keats is one of the most highly regarded poems in the English language. It is richly imagistic and descriptive. Write your own ode to Autumn. And this is one that I thought was going to be easy and I wanted to do. I was looking forward to it. I didn't come up with anything. Um, Megan didn't either. We had, kind of had a busy week. Um, but we do have a green poem. Um, Colin wanted to share a poem. We'll go, we'll go to the mailbag segment, I guess we'll call this. And... Um, so, so Colin had a poem last week for the prompt that we also didn't get to. Um, remember last week was um, if you're driving, you're di driving through the desert and you come upon a building, and what is that building? That was kind of the, the prompt for the week. And my son Colin, who's seven, wrote a poem for this. Um, and let's see. And um, here it is, Colin's poem. There it is fit all this i have to move it around a little bit to get it to fit but this is x tower he says i was driving at midnight when a tower came into sight there was an x at the top of it it was blue and purple the colors changed smoothly as the wind blowed once we passed the tower the land was changing colors were in the sky 
That is X Tower by Colin Green, a uh, a, po- a prompt poem from last week. And um, I'm, I'm so happy you did that because uh, for the people who used to come to our um, live events at the Flint Ridge Bookstore in LA, um, Josephina, my daughter, started when she was like five, maybe even four to age like maybe nine when we stopped doing the series. Um, she'd always start off the open mic with a poem too. So um, it's great to get Colin into the mix as well. Thanks for sharing that, Colin. And um, I have another thing from the um, from the mailbag that I meant to read a couple weeks ago too. And this is from Taylor Molly. Here's a little note. Dear Tim, just a letterpress broadside that you were not expecting. The heart Taylor. So this is from Taylor Molly. And this is a, a beautiful a letterpress broadside that he sent, Undivided Attention. And um, here it is. So I'm going to read this this on the air too. This is undivided attention. A grand piano wrapped in quilted pads by movers tied up with canvas straps like classical music's birthday gift to the criminally insane is gently nudged without its legs out an eighth floor window on 62nd street. It dangles in April air from the neck of the mover's crane, chopping shiny black lacquer squares and dirty white crisscross patterns hanging like the second-to-last note of a concerto played on the edge of the seat, the edge of tears, the edge of eight stories up going over. It's a piano pushed out of a window and lowered down onto the flatbed truck, and I'm trying to teach math in the building across the street. Who can teach when there are such lessons to be learned? All the greatest common factors are delivered by long-necked cranes and flatbed trucks or or come through everything, even air, like snow. See, snow falls for the first time every year, and every year my students rush to the window as if snow were more interesting than math, which, of course, it is. So please, let me teach like a Steinway spinning slowly in the April air, so almost falling, so hinderingly dangling from the neck of the mover's crane, so on the edge of losing everything. Let me teach like the first snow falling. And of course, Taylor Molly. Uh, you can find more at taylormolly.com. He was also on Rattlecast, I don't know, around like maybe 60 or something last, about a year a year ago. And he's going to be at the um, uh, Wrightwood Arts Festival in May uh, 2022 as well. So um, that's Taylor Molly, Undivided Attention, Great poem. Of course, he's really well known as a, as a promoter of teachers and a, a sort of a teacher's advocate. And um, a great poem about teaching to Undivided Attention by Taylor Molly. Okay, so those are the two mailbag things I wanted to share this week. And I think I'll make that a regular feature because we do get a lot of stuff in the mail. Um, and now let's go to, like I said, we'll go to, um, um, we'll go to Julian Matthews first, then we'll do uh, Nivedita. And then and Mike Bales, and then we'll get to these first time callers. There's a 407 now and a 862. So that's the order, and then we'll we'll keep going from there. So um, here comes Julian Matthews. Hey, Julian, how you doing today? Hi. Yeah, it's great to see you. And I just opened up what you sent, the compass, and saw that it was uh, after one of Taylor Molly's props. So what are the uh, the coincidences there? I just read his, his uh, broadside that he sent us. Yeah, coincidence. So he gave a prompt uh, last week uh, based on his metaphor dice, and the prompt was Tears are an Ancient Compass. Yeah, and just to explain what that is, that's a, a teaching tool that he came up with, and um, he, he did this on the Rattlecast episode that was about a year ago. Um, and there, each set of dice has like a noun, a verb, and an adjective, I think. And then you roll them, and then you end up with these weird combinations. And that's a prompt, kind of a teaching tool for prompts. And so um, it was Tears Ancient Compass was what the role was? Yeah, Tears and Ancient Compass. So every Monday, he does a little Instagram broadcast. Mm-hmm. He gets uh, viewers to chip in as well. Uh, yeah, that's great. That's really cool. I'll have to check that out. It's on Instagram. Metaphor underscore dice on Instagram. I wonder if I should be um, putting the the Rattlecast on Instagram. I kind of didn't never thought of that. I wonder if there's a time limit. Um, but anyway, yeah, so so uh, why don't you go ahead and read this whenever you're ready. I have it up on screen for everybody at home. So this is called The Compass. Tears are an ancient compass. 
constantly pointing south for the Sabina Nessas of the world, Muslim, brown, South Asian descent, and for the 700 indigenous women missing from the same area Gabby Petito was found. Tears are an ancient compass, but N E W S without the N is only use to you. Your compass is a screen colored with your flighty bias. You're not lost, just feathering your nest with your fears. Your needle is magnetized by influences who flock together and never fly south east nor west every winter of our lives as if we even needed a winter to remind us of all the seasons of killing our tears are an ancient compass the tracks of which lead to an ocean that will never wet the cheek of you your compass is broken a powerful poem uh, that was the compass, and, and great uh, roll of the metaphor dice there. Our, our tears are an ancient compass. What a great way to go with it. Thanks for sharing that, Julian. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, always a pleasure. Talk to you soon. So, uh, Julian Matthews with the compass. And uh, I said next we would do, oh, Nivedita. Let's do Nivedita next. Yes, and Nivedita's here, so let's call it Nivy. Hey, Nivedita, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, thank you. How about you? I'm doing great. It's a great way to start the day. I kind of like the, the, for me, morning shows. Um, I like them a little better. I'm going to put up a poll, I think, um, and see who, who, what time do you like better? Um, I, I don't know. Well, well, I'll put it up on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I, I don't know. I kind of like to start out the day this way. I, I, I sort of lean toward it now, and maybe we'll make it mornings eventually. Um, but we'll see. I'm going to put up a poll. So that, so yeah, I, I didn't even mean to say that. I don't know why I said that, but <laughs> once I have the poll up, I will tell everybody where to go vote. Um, but anyway, so what did you want to share today? Um, I have both a prompt poem and a new story poem. So, okay, sure. Um, is this, let's see. Um, okay. I have it here. Um, let's do the prompt poem first. Right, that's the first one that came up. So this is your ode to autumn. Is there anything you want to say about it? Pretty simple self-explanatory and sort of uh, in a simpler style because, I mean, it is fall. We fall for fall. And then it's, it's sort of more like how we fall for fall and the thoughts we think about it in that instance. So this is penned as we were thinking about it. Not It's not something that you sit and refine and refresh. So this is in the moment pending of what I thought ought to meant to me at least. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. I'm looking forward to hearing this. Go ahead whenever you're ready. Ode to Autumn, orange, the color of autumn, the color of joy, the color that brings out in each of us our inner girl and boy. As we amble through the crunchy leaves strewn beneath our feet while munching on caramel apples and other tasty treats, the walls of the autumn bend the boughs of the trees. The melody of autumn rustles through the fallen leaves. The golden harvest moon shimmers in the sky, while closer home, the scent of peppermint latte walks by. The orchards are gowned in glorious maroons and reds, while the cornstalks, tall and gleaming yellow, gently nod their heads. The dewy mornings are now a thing of the past, as autumn has come battling in through the door at last. Excellent. That was a great poem. Nivedita Karthik, uh, that was Ode to Autumn. Thanks for sharing that. And, uh, and what was the, uh, the news poem about? It's about uh, Mama Bear and her cub who come to a school playground and actually play on the slides. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow okay oh it's good it's a youtube video so i can just play it let's see if ad pop up first okay here so um here comes this oh wow okay so we gotta we definitely have to play this this is cute um let me go to the screen view yeah, here we go so here are the bears playing on uh slides in the at the playground <laughs> That's cute. I want to see them go down. I w I w I'll pause it as soon as they go down the slide. I'm sure they're going <laughs> to. Oh, here it goes. 
the mama bear's going oh my gosh <laughs> that, is, that was pretty cute so um i think i'm the only one that can hear it but but all the um the the people in the background i didn't turn the sound on but the people in the background are all rooting for it to go down the slide too which was cute and then they get so happy when <laughs> when she does um okay so uh so your poem here is playtime and um anything else you want to say about it um, I know. Again, it's just a fun news story, a fun poem, like I usually mm -hmm. do. Not yeah. Small than that. Okay. okay. Well, well, let's hear it. It's playtime. Excuse me, for I didn't see you there, waiting for your turn on the slide. I'm just trying to teach my baby bear how not to tumble down the hillside. We really are some friendly bears. Just give us some fish, extra air, and we'll soon get out of your head. For all this play has made us so hungry, we do swear. But fear not, for we'll soon be on our way. And out of your school yet before the recess hits. We don't encroach on your land, nor are we here to stay. We know when and where to call it quits. Another great poem. Thanks so much for, for highlighting that video and, and writing a poem about it, Nivy. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Tim. It's lovely talking to you, too. Yep. yep. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Uh, yeah, Nivy DeCarthic with uh, two poems. And um, who did I say was? Oh, yeah, Mike Bales. And then we'll go to these um, first time callers after Mike. Um, there it is. Well, Tim, let me step away from the laptop. Yeah, no problem. Uh, how are you doing today, Mike? Uh, uh, pretty good. Um, Marissa's just great. Um, I'm kind of getting up and doing stuff. I've got to go to someone's book signing. I already bought her book and there's something down at the coffee shop, Roz Talks, where there are different poets reading. I read there, like, the last time. Yeah, I remember and that. Just and, uh, a couple things to catch. Yeah, it's cool that they have, uh, you know, in-person stuff again. It's it's nice. We had our first one last last week or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago. And uh, it was refreshing yeah, think... to, to get out and, you know, and just see people again and, and have that sort of social interaction. Very nice. Yeah, I'm glad to do readings. There's a thing that's more for poet for performance poets that I do about every month. It's called Roaring Rhetoric. And I do there, and the host is a friend from years and gives me awesome introductions. I've sold a few copies of that book of mine that came out last fall there, and the audience is just great. Yeah, that's that's great. It's great to have that resource. Uh, so what poem did you want to share? Um, well, I may email it to you, Song of Fall. A couple things I can say is um, it alludes to this fall I spent at Iowa State in Ames. Mm -hmm. And it alludes to um, time I spent as a highway flagger, which was my last book was about, you know, traveling around the Midwest. Mm -hmm. That's the guy who makes you stop and makes you late for work when there's a one lane road. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and it alludes to a musical group. Um, this poem's called Song of Fall. Okay, go ahead. I have it up. Tree branches gesture to sky as September fades into October shadows. A breeze stirs memories, the strains of Badfinger I played on a rainy afternoon instead of seeing my college football team play. Day after day, I remember the tale of how Pete Ham, the lead singer, had died and the songs he sung. I remember the cloudy afternoon when friends and I gathered leaves, the laughter and conversations. I remember the day I stood on his shoulder while workers rushed to pave a highway before the first fall of snow. I watched a pair of birds obscuring placid skies near cornfields of gold awaiting harvest. I remember the song of November winds, the time when limbs of naked trees danced as silhouettes grasping onto what was left, of fading days when the silent moon rose over bare fields. The last sun, passages burnt into umber skies sought comfort of dreams versus I carry with age. A hey, great poem. Thanks for sharing that, Mike. And that, that yeah. book of yours sounds interesting too. Um, you know, the, the perspective of, uh, so you said you, uh, as a flagger, you were all over the Midwest. Like how, how far was like the reach of, of the places that you went while doing that? Um, the furthest I went and it was life changing is when I worked in the Black Hills, of mm -hmm. South Dakota in that area. Uh -huh. That's the furthest I went. Um, it was also very influential when I worked in Wisconsin, especially 
in and around the Nicolay National Forest. Mm -hmm. So I worked there. I worked in far end of Nebraska. I worked there. Mostly the work was canceled. Um, Then I got to see the world's largest coming back. I had to go from there to an assignment in Des Moines. Coming Mm -hmm. back, I got to see the world's largest uh, train switching yard in I'm trying to remember the name of the town, Norfolk, I think. Mm-hmm. Not Norfolk, but I'm trying to think the yeah. town in western Nebraska. Um, then I went to Des Moines. At, uh, I was at a time when I was living with different people when I wasn't totally satisfied with being in the Quad Cities. And um, I needed, I had a feeling I needed to travel to write, and I did. I'm still writing poems influenced by it. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, thanks for sharing that that poem and, and your story, Mike. I appreciate it. Okay, thanks for having me. Yep. All right, Have a good day. Bye. That was Mike Bales and um, with Song of Fall, I think it was called. I, I already closed it off. I think it was Song of Fall, yeah. Okay, let's go to one of these first-time callers next. And we have um, the 407. Wait. Yes, we have the 407. Let's try 407. It might just be somebody I didn't put in the phone book, too. Let's see. I'm sorry to have missed your call. Please leave your name and... <laughs> so whoever it is, uh, I could try it again. That is a 407 number. Um, it was someone who was on before, actually, a year ago. So I'm not sure who that who that was. I guess that was before I was actually putting people in the phone book. Um, who could that be? Looking at the, at the poem list. I'm not sure. But whoever it is, uh, call again if you're still listening, and I'll call you up. Um, otherwise, I'll assume that, that, uh, that you moved on with your Sunday. But uh, but do call again if you'd like to still share 407, whoever that is. Um, and let's see. Okay, let's call up next. Uh, let's go to uh, Peter O'Donohue. We'll get him during the day for what, for a change. I guess it's evening already. Peter, hello. Are you there, Peter? I heard you for a second. Hmm. Well, Peter O'Donohue from uh, from Ireland, of course, has um. You there, Peter? I'm here. I'm here. Here you are. Hello. <laughs> How's it going, uh, Timothy? It's going great. Glad glad to see you. Uh, what do you have to share with us today? I see your elbow basically, but <laughs> if you want to tip okay. the camera up a little bit, there you Jesus. go. <laughs> now there I am in all my horrible glory. <laughs> Excellent. Well, it's, um, great to, it's great to see you. How are you doing today? I'm great. I really enjoyed the show. Marissa was fantastic. Yes, I, yes, she was. I loved her answer about how she got into poetry. It was it was so eloquent and informative and interesting. The whole thing was great. And you have a great way about you with people. You're well, just thanks. so calm <laughs> and kind. And, you know, it's just a lovely environment to be in. Well, thanks. I really uh, appreciate so, that, Peter. That, that's okay. I'm going to spoil it all now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hope nobody's offended by this. It's supposed to be just a bit of fun, a bit of satire. And uh, will I just read it? Yeah, go ahead. I'll put it up on screen for everybody and uh, go ahead and read it. Okay. Uh, it's the Gospel According to Badger, number two. Three days later, God Jebus awaked from his death slumber and was mighty thirsty, not for truth or revenge, but for a cup of tea. Bring me Barabbas, he yelled. And the disciplines looked from one to the other and yet back again. Barabbas, sire? One inquired tremulously. Barabbas, did I say Barabbas? Yes, lordy. Sorry, sorry, I meant Lazarus. The finest tea maker this side of the Euphrates. Fetch him hence and tell him to bring a packet of hobnobs, chocolate ones. Ah, Sager, alas, poor Lazarus has taken to the drink. The drink? Since when, me damn it? Since that wedding at Cana, my lordship. Oh, oh yeah, I feck it. Let's go to Costa for a coffee instead. I've a cracking parable to tell ye. Wait till you hear it. And so the cohort shuffled and mumbled, mumbled behind their leader, all dust 
sandals, and conspicuous absence of humans with vaginas, towards the promised land of skinny lattes and blueberry muffins. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Pierre. Always a pleasure. Ha happy to have that poem. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Bye. That was Peter O'Donohue, of course, with uh, The Gospel According to Badger Number 2. And, um, yeah, that was good stuff. Thanks, Peter. Um, okay, next up, we'll go to um, Carla Schwartz. Hey, Carla, how you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. We finally had an overnight in our houseboat, so we're like lying down in the houseboat. Oh, excellent. And I woke I woke up early and we went swimming around an island that we were visiting. So oh, it's like a one one mile swim around the island. Very and, nice. uh, so, so where where is the island? Like where are you? It's we're in Lake Nipisaki, mm -hmm. and the island is called Three Mile Island, but it's not the not one the in one. Pennsylvania. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, cool. Well, I'm so uh, yeah, I'm so glad you could join us from uh, from from the shores of Three Mile Island. Yeah, yeah, I'm very happy actually, <laughs> and we're not on the shore; we're in the water on the boat, and it's in really the nice. We're, yeah, yeah, the the. Um, Solar wasn't that good today because it was rainy yesterday and today. So we're like waiting to juice up before we go home. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I'm glad you could connect on and do the Rattlecast. Uh, what poem do you have to share with us? So I um, I submitted one to the um, to the uh, poet's response. Mm -hmm. I, but if you can't uh, show it, I did send you a photograph of it. Okay, I'll um, I'll pull it up there. I think. I mean, the photograph works too. But um, but I can. Okay. It's not edited since. No, no, no. Okay. No, no. Um, it's a... Let's see. I, I'll just, I, since I have it up, I'll just use this. Perry, Georgia. I'll, I'll just use yeah, the, Perry, the screen grab. Right. Perry, Georgia. Okay. The glint. Oh, and this is based on, um, the, there was a rally in the town of Perry, Georgia at a fairgrounds last weekend on Saturday. Uh, it was a Trump rally. Mm. And um, the it was take, took place in an arena, which is called the Reeves Ar Arena, which is actually named for a Democratic local representative. Hmm. Okay. God, it, man. Yeah, interesting. Okay. All right. Perry, Georgia. The glint of pomade in your airbrushed hair sprayed across your forehead, your teeth whiter than white, and your anger white curled under your lips your darted gaze all over the place. How does your audience know to hold up their Save Americas on cue? How much are they paid for this op for you? Pretend you're not embarrassed for pushing the lies. Stand among those Trump One shirts, those Blacks for Trump slogans you buy. You see no irony Something in the arena named for another damned dem you couldn't deflect. Not ashamed to pull your numbers from a hat. Here are some numbers for you. My father drove our 62 Beetle way 75 at 95 until he burned the engine out. Four of us stranded by the side of the road, Perry, Georgia, 67 before the fairgrounds ever was. Another father, Jesus, hanging from the rear view, stopped to help. Such a small town, the stranger found us a toe and a meal. We, New Yorkers like you, just a small family en route to Florida, now in our rented Bel Air, grateful for the air conditioning. Then, to a stranger, my father had the grace to acknowledge his mistake. Great poem, Carla. Thanks for sharing that. Um, oh, great, thank yeah. you so much. Yeah, it, um, it just other... occurred to me that um, how there's still Trump rallies, even though you never hear anything about Trump. How do well, people yeah, even so know? He, <laughs> but it, but I, it, I don't. He he had this Trump, and I think the theme of it was called "Save America." Mm -hmm. And you know, so and he went out there and he was, you know, dissing anybody who wasn't you know in his camp. Yeah. Including Kemp, in fact, the governor oh, yeah. of Georgia. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, and the other thing was that in the numbers that he was referring to was the day before mm-hmm. they did the recount in Arizona. Yeah. Well, it, it's but, just yeah. occurred to me that they must, you know, people must be organizing to go to rallies. There must be a whole separate sort of digital universe now with, uh, you know, like they must be on because you never I used to have friends that were Trump supporters and stuff. And you never see hear from them anymore. They must have all gone to like Telegram and and um, uh, Rumble and, you know, the 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 alternative media stuff because you don't see any, any. I haven't seen the word Trump in so long. <laughs> I, um, I actually did. I mean, I heard about this mm-hmm. rally on NPR before it happened. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And yeah. Yeah, that yeah. was going to happen that day. Yeah. But anyway, yes. All right. Thank you so much for yeah. the time. Yeah, well, enjoy the what rest of your great... time on, on the boat, Carla. Thank you. All yeah. right. Bye. Bye-bye. It was that uh, Carla Schwartz with Perry, Georgia. And um, so, uh, ah, the call of me was Carlton Johnson. So let's read Carlton's poem. He was calling from a different number. That's why. So there's a, um, he has a, a random journey. There's a reference to Wikipedia. Um, and then here's the co-master. I'll show this, uh, this link. A co-master is a, um, a genus of crini- crinoids. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a marine, like a coral, I guess. Um, you see the picture down here. And so this is, uh, this is what the co-master is that, uh, Carlton, uh, Johnson's poem is referring to and his poem is here a random journey um oops there we go a random journey here this is carlton johnson this morning is an exercise i hit wikipedia's random article link to elicit a prompt and feathered tendrils dancing in pacific waters beckoned me to take a wild romp i was in haste with so much to do no time to waste Though I wished I were a co-master, moved by currents blue and clear, silencing all the hullabaloo. This evening, the breath of sun falls on dewdrops and bluebonnets groping for life, the wonder of white transmuted clouds shrouding never-ending splendor, of autumn's long shadows pulling me away from the safety of the shoreline into the darker days in resplendent depths. That was a great poem, A Random Journey by Carlton Schwartz. Thanks so much, or Carlton Johnson. Thanks so much, Carlton, for sharing that poem. And um, let's see, who else do we have here? Let's read Ted Guevara's uh, autumn prompt. Autumn is the season. And um, here this one is. This is Ted Bernal Guevara from the prompt. Um, here. Autumn is the season. You asked me to simplify my thoughts so you can leave, but the words I gave are not for simplification. It had to be done. I am your stilts, your brace against the wind. Do not disown me because I cling to you as well. You asked me to stop pouring out my soul. You prefer my old kindred heart, kind heart, the one that can't stand still, still. You're willing to suggest another crime for me to commit. And in that, I will be confined. Then you wonder if autumn would exist in the cell I would be in. In my logic, I'd say no. Budding will always grow in there. No harsh wind in such a closed space. You nod, but imagine falling leaves still. I've lamed, I've lamed the man, not cut short his life. No, nothing would be detached from me. I would be as whole as you had left me. I see no decline, slide, or falling. You misread my confinement as end, but I see only as a phase, I see it only as a phase, an episode where I dip and you keep aligned. In that cell, I will live the stagnant life, the emptiness of you, but the wild withering of a season will pass. I love that wild withering of a season will pass. That was Ted Guevara. I'm sorry for tripping over a few lines that, for some reason, the the font type, coupled with the way it's shrunk on my screen here, makes a few of the letters a little difficult to to pick up in the in the aerial. Um, but thanks for sharing that. Autumn is the last season by Ted Guevara. Um, and let's see. I want to make sure. So we have Richard Westheimer still. We have. Um, 
Okay, so I'm, I'll, I'll do read. Uh, I don't see Jose Gonzalez here. Um, and this isn't going to fit on the screen. It's a prose poem, uh, but I'll just read it here. This is Jose Gonzalez, this autumn poem. It is autumn. The leaves, everything is so greeny. I feel rejuvenated, like I took a Viagra. I'm full of energy. I'm taking it all in, everything, the sun, the rays. I am enjoying it, is getting a little chiller. That is why I have my jacket on, but I love it all. You take it all in a nice smell. It is the earth. I take it all in it. It's still great weather. It is autumn. I was getting tired of summer, but I don't want winter to come. Is around the corner. That is what I don't like. That is uh, Jose Gonzalez with Autumn Poem. Thanks for sharing that, Jose. And um, let's see. Okay, let's call up uh, Carlton Johnson now. I mean, not Carlton Johnson. Richard Westheimer. Let's call up Richard. I think Richard will close out the show. Then we'll do a Saiku. And then I have a softball doubleheader. Hey, Richard. Great to see you. Hey, Tim. It's good to see you. And as often as... As often as I've had that 30-second delay, it always sort of like, <laughs> like ma- makes me jump because I'm, I'm, you know, in that case, I was immersed in the last poem. Oh, you know? that's right. Yeah, yeah. That because would be. Mm-hmm. screen, I was doing that sort of like what you have to do to listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, um, so I, I just wanted to say I, I love this community of poets. That me too. Spoke. It's always yeah. just. Yeah, uh, I, I I love the way poets come together and and a, a community always emerges. I mean, everything I've done, there's always ends up being community, and it's just it's just wonderful to see different people become friends and connect, and and I just love it. So it's great to have, and great to have you all here too. I I don't know if I say it enough, but I really appreciate that we have people who are here every week to make it, um, you know, feel like like we're all getting together, sitting around sharing poems, which was the goal, you know, and you have to have people there to share poems with uh, every week. Well, so I really sharing, appreciate it. And it's yeah. sort of in the context of having listened to the same interview and, you know, listened mm-hmm. to the same other poetry. And um, I, I loved her work. Some of it had like, it was like a woodblock rhythm to it, it felt like. Uh, yeah, there's just so much music and so much um, just interesting images too. Like the, um, I don't know, there's so many great things. I, I love her work too. So a quick thing on the tides. Mm-hmm. Uh so what happens, the reason why the moon the moon is accelerating is because it's sort of recursive relationship with the tides. Oh, interesting. So somehow there's a feedback loop where the tides, hmm. you know, quickly or very slowly, imperceptibly accelerate the moon. Oh, and it's wow. been, it's been mm-hmm. leaving our orbit since it started in our orbit. Wow, I had no idea. Well, thanks for, for for clarifying that. That's really cool to hear. So the tide, yeah, that, I guess I could see how that would make sense. And it would like, be, t- you know, it was tides before they were tide. They were still mm-hmm. bulging yeah, uh, mm-hmm. uh, of, of the crust. So even just that little bit of bulging, uh, I guess uh, the moon gets ahead of it and, and the bulge follows it. And, mm-hmm. and, and, yeah. I'm, and I'm done. <laughs> well, that, that's really interesting I, I really want to read more about that mechanism that, that's interesting um, yeah, so, and, so what did you want to share I think you had two poems right I have two do you have time for two yeah I think you're the last caller and, and we're, we're plenty of time so what okay um, well, do I'll, do, I'll do my prompt poem first because that was that just happened this morning I got up and thought noon I just until noon <laughs> and then I had another poetry call earlier so mm. uh, so so sometimes Things work out when when you don't have time to yeah. sort of ruminate over it. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, so this one, awakening one autumn morning. Last night, my lover returned. She had left when the days were still long, and each was filled from end to end with the demands of growing things, the constant pulling of weeds, the smashing of harlequin beetles that had ravaged the greens, the picking and putting up all that August offered. This morning, we wake together near naked, walk from the, night, from the night, walk to the bedroom window. The dawn mists sitting on the new cut field have lifted sufficiently that we can see seven deer already thinning at the ribs, nosing in the poor fodder of fall. Nearby, seven wild turkeys forage, fattening on the dislodged seeds and grubs my mowing exposed. 
the early October sun seems so low slung compared with just weeks ago. The shorter days, though still summer warm at the noon hour, are like one of those old time photos colorized over a sepia tinge vignetted by these earlier evenings and the lazy morning sun taking its time to peer over the still green leaf trees. Today's rain is welcome after weeks and weeks of, of drought. The sweet petrichor and cooler air freshen the feel of return. The promise of longer nights, that and us sitting together on the old couch that has been empty in your absence, us writing poems just to each other. Oh, I love that. Great turn at the end. And I love, uh, you know, this is my favorite time of year. I love this time of year. And you captured it really wonderfully there. Thanks for sharing that, Richard. Thanks. Yeah, I, I appreciate, you know, the prompts get me thinking about things that I wouldn't be otherwise. So it's great. And uh, prompt poem, just a quick note on the uh, your comment with the 10 for 400 <laughs> uh, prompt poem, which of course made the rest of us feel great, you know, 400, is I... I do the same thing. It's really been a wonderful exercise just to find my find something that I might find myself in. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of what the exercise is for me is just what what winds up being something that prompts me to think that I might find myself in this story. Yeah, it feels like like what poetry does is try to is help you pay attention to the world a little bit more. And so looking for something to write about makes you pay attention to what you're reacting to, it would seem to me. I really, really want to write one every week, um, too. I think it'd be a great practice just in general. Um, so maybe maybe someday we'll <laughs> find more time and, and uh, more write one every week, too. Tough, yeah. Tough three line psycho. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but so what did you want to share? The, um... uh, so this was some other grandpa okay. and it was responding to uh, this notion of crisis standards of care and hospitals now where, you know, there's some forms of rationing going on, mm -hmm. but not here, maybe. So here's the reveal, some other grandpa. Okay. Here's the reveal. I've assumed it would be some other grandpa who'd fall ill, arrive at his local ER and find the doors pulled shut, he on the outside rapping weakly on the glass, cupping his hands against the pane, peering inside, seeing scrubs-dressed nurses hurrying from one gurney to the next. He spots a man in there who waves his hands in a gesture that means no more, mouths the words, go away. I imagine a hospital lobby filled with unvaxxed virus deniers, those fake news spewing rubes asserting their rights right before the, a trach tube splits their vocal cords and reduces their protests to a relentless hiss, thump, bump, hiss, thump, bump that beats in the ear of every ICU nurse, haunts them when they sit to eat, follows them home, lies between them and their lovers, infects their dreams until so many walk away from that god-awful job, leaving one less nurse, then one less nurse, then one less nurse to tend to the ordinarily infirmed, the heart infarcted clutching their chests, the fading cancer patients, and those who gasp for air for reasons other than COVID. For them, triage will seem as sinister as a work camp guard in spurred boots barking. This one is fit for the factory floor, as he points to admissions. This one, he licks a pencil tip before putting an X on his checklist and singles out some other grandpa. Is weak, is worth less, and will die soon anyway, as he points to the exit. Today, my heart spoke to me in the plainest possible language, pain, but not the burning shame I should have felt for failing to care about some other grandpa, but the sort when coronary arteries clamp, the kind that feels like a snake wound its way inside each lung, lodged in my throat, whisper hissed to me, you are an old man, you are the other grandpa who will be turned away when they tally the score and decide who is worth tending to and who is on his own. You are the one whose knock will not unlock the door. Excellent. Another great poem, uh, some other grandpa. Thanks so much, Dick. Thanks, Tim. Have a good week. Yep, you too. Bye. It's Richard Westheimer with Some Other Grandpa, and uh, the other one was 
I lost it already. The other one was Awakening One Autumn Morning. That's right. Um, okay, so I do. Leave, let me do one more quick check. Make sure I didn't miss anybody. I would hate to do that. Um, okay, I think we got everybody. So the the uh, Saiku for this week is um, right about here. Now this is a. I actually made a mistake. This would would be thrown out of the poetry respond pool because um, this article is actually from September 1st. So how I do these, usually, um, you know, if there's interesting articles I read throughout the week, I just bookmark them. And then right before I go to bed on Saturday night, I um, read the article again, figure out which one I want to do a haiku about. And then just as I'm drifting off to sleep, I sort of have the haiku, the idea of this needs to be a haiku in my head and kind of thinking about it. And, um, and somehow I missed that the date is actually September 1st and not October 1st from this article. But uh, here the article is, though. And this is, um, it's still interesting. This is why tiny tidigrades walk like insects 500,000 times their size. Animals this small and squishy usually don't have legs. And so this research that came out a month ago, and not actually this week, I'm sorry. Um, these researchers took these um, tidigrades, and there you can see a tidigrade walking. And um, they, they walk, you know, usually when you see one in a picture under a camera or under a microscope, they're about a half a millimeter in size. And so you need to look at them in a microscope and usually they're suspended in, in water and sort of swimming around. So, but we know what they have feet. So what these researchers did is put a sort of a sticky gel at the bottom of a slide. So then they could watch how they actually walk. And then they set up these cameras in the lab to uh, learn how they walk. And um, it turns out that they walk very much like insects do. Whereas depending on the speed that they want to locomote, they uh, sometimes they just move one leg at a time, and then there's a way that they, as they pick up speed, they pick up a sort of pattern that's unique to um, insects and not other kind of um, you know animals that that walk. And so they were talking about this and and how it might be more related to insects than we realize. And it made me wonder, um, you know, that that um, there should be. I assume we've done the genome. Um, you know, sequence the genome for tardigrades. And um, it made me look up some other articles and, and find this whole, um, around 2014, there was a really interesting um, paper that came out that was immediately and they shot down, but that's how science works. It was cool. They, they tried to do the genome and they found that it had like a third of the genome was like bacteria and other organisms and not animals. And so they published all these articles about it you know, in places like live science saying um, that, that these are even stranger than we thought because their their DNA is a mix of all sorts of creatures through horizontal transfer. And it turned out that that was just contaminated slides that they were pulling out the DNA from. And um, researchers have sequenced the genome fully as of 2017, and they're actually related to nematodes. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was all interesting. That was uh, my little science stroll, like a tardy grade, which means slow walker in the Latin. And this was the the psyche about the humble little tardy grade. Here it is. Tardy grades playing under the glass slip and slide. Tardy grades playing under the glass slip and slide. That is your psyche for today. And your uh, prompt for next week is right here. A very simple prompt we got for you. The prompt is write a poem without using articles, such as a, an, or the. A poem with no articles. So um, that is your prompt for this week. Very open-ended, but very, uh, very restrictive in how you can write. So let's see what you come up with with that. That is the prompt for next week. And next week's guest is going to be Mark Jarman. Uh, Mark is, is a really personally significant poem to me i was a when i was an undergraduate as a, as a molecular biology major at the u of r i used to just go in the stacks there and pull up books at random and um one of the books i happened to pull out was uh mark's unholy sonnets and that is one of the books that made me fall in love with poetry he has, he has a new book um the the heronry is his most recent book of poetry we'll, we'll read poems from there he has a new book that's coming out next year. We'll read poems from that. And then he has a book of essays on poetry, Dailiness, too, which we're going to feature here. He has a poem in the current issue uh, that is Mark Jarman, um, Rattlecast number 113, Sunday at the, for now, regular time, October 10th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a good rest of your Sunday. 
and I will talk to you soon. Thanks again for being here and uh, sharing part of your Sundays with me. It's just always a pleasure, and uh, I, I just love you. So thanks so much for being you and for being here, and I will see you next week. Goodbye. <laughs>